Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Ourselves. Is there anyone here this morning for the first time, first or second time? Okay. There's a short half hour of social time after the speaker, so if you want to hang out with us, we'll be some more members. We'll be start back in the corner. I'm Sean Dimipuka. My name's Gary. I'm Peter Kakoa. My name's Tom Bruin. My name is David Margolis. My name is Tony Wilson. My name is John Bacalier. Jack Bosley. <coughs> My name is Katie Chimodia. My name is Ray Donovan. My name is John Curry. Peter. My name is Michael. My name is John Miranda. Paul. <coughs> I'm Chris Russo. My name is Tom Morrissey. I'm with Waldo Garcia. My name is Jerry Jones. Jim. My name is Andreas. I'm Ron. My name is Roy. My name is Jim Stewart. Patrick. <coughs> Bruce. My name is Tony. Uh, my name is Harley Shapiro. My name is Jim. <coughs> my name is Andre. My name is Paul Alfred. My name is Isla. Jonathan Schaffner. Bob. Oh, Peter. I'm Kay Matsuda. <coughs> My name is Manuel. My name is John Wessel. My name is Gary. My name is Red. Did I miss anybody? My name is Bert. <coughs> um, we're very fortunate this morning to have a speaker from the San Francisco Zen Center for the second week in a row. <laughs> ben Bender has been a student of Soto Zen since 1984. After moving to San Francisco from Germany, he began his studies at the San Francisco Zen Center, receiving lay ordination from Tenshin Reb Anderson in 1996. He has lived at all three practice centers and has translated several Buddhist texts from English to German. Baron was also Susho, which is head student, during the city center practice period in 2009. He is inspired by how the simplicity of practice meets the <coughs> infinite complexity of life. Welcome, Barry. Thank you very much for this introduction. So I feel very honored and joyful to be invited by, I would say, all of you to come here this morning and the way I see it, share the Dharma with you. There are two things I feel I need to say. As you just heard, I live uh, at Zen Center, this big brown building on the corner of Page and Laguna, where supposedly <coughs> we dedicate a lot of our time to sitting still and uh, sitting in silence. <coughs> However, this last week I have been talking so much that actually yesterday I lost my voice. So, <clears throat> one of the complexities of uh, life at Zen Center. So I just want to say this because if you can't hear me, please, I, I please <coughs> encourage you to raise your arm and I will see that and try to speak up, okay? So, um, <clears throat> second thing, uh, when Chris kindly drove me over this morning was, I was thinking of um, a class I taught a couple of weeks ago 
at Zen Center on mind-only teachings. So let's say pretty complex stuff. However, I encourage myself and the people in class over and over by saying that the mode of study in practice, and I want to say this to you now, the mode of study in practice is to let go of all grasping. And I think that a little bit runs, runs counter to how we usually see and experience things, maybe even right now. <clears throat> so, uh, I feel this is a laboratory for myself, but also for you to, um, if you think you understand something, practice is to let go of it. If you think that this doesn't make any sense, practice is to let go of that. And I would propose to you that in this way, you enter the truth of your life. Also, I was here last week, and of course, I don't know who you are, but I thought, I can't give a Zen lecture. And, but then I feel a Zen lecture might come out of me today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have this, uh, we have this uh, Japanese founder of Zen, uh, Dogen Zenji, who lived in Japan in the 13th century. And in an essay entitled uh, Actualizing the Fundamental Point, Actualizing the Fundamental Point, he wrote, as all things, as all things are Buddha Dharma, there is delusion and realization, practice and birth and death and they are Buddhas and sentient beings. As the myriad things are without an abiding self, there is no delusion, no realization, no Buddha, no sentient being, no birth, no death. And then he continues and says, the Buddha way is basically leaping. The Buddha way is basically leaping beyond the many and the one. Thus, there are birth and death, delusion and realization, sentient beings and Buddhas. <clears throat> so, what is the fundamental point? What is most important for me in my life? What is most important for you in your life? And I assume, and I think, I hope, I'm very open to the fact that there are different answers to this question. And maybe each one of you would answer in a different way but um, this morning, I would like to suggest to you that the fundamental point which needs to be actualized in practice is intimacy. So that's my intention. That this morning, <coughs> I would like to explore intimacy together with you, um, intimacy as I see it as the path of practice, um, but also as the content and the realization of practice. Um, as a way to uh, 
enter this topic, I would like to make a few um, cursory remarks, or in a way, I would like to maybe circumambulate it. Um, I don't know about you, but these days I'm very struck and touched by the energy of spring. Actually, quite strongly, at times it feels to me as if right here in San Francisco we had a Siberian winter. However, what I'm feeling is not just uh, sweet or exquisite. It's not just a wish to um, uh, grow, <coughs> bloom, or blossom. It's somehow beyond that. Um, what I feel is a powerful mix of emotions and actually quite contradictory. Uh, spring for me these days is uh, feelings of uh, excess, of um, agonizing beauty, and uh, at times striking brutality. Dogen brings up birth and death. And I feel these days, uh, birth and death, are very closely linked. <laughs> like, like this. Like, sometimes in my mind's eye, I see a bird's nest. Kind of beautiful image. Let's say five eggs in it. However, maybe one will accident accidentally be kicked out. Two eggs will be eaten by a snake. So two baby birds finally hatch. One becomes a cat's prey and one will finally be able to fly. So this is what I mean by the excesses of spring and maybe uh, the sense of agonizing beauty but also brutality uh, influenced and was felt by T.S. Eliot when he wrote April is the cruelest month. Excess, as I see it, is a going beyond. And uh, I'm very amazed, very in touch these days with the fact that I'm alive in a universe where things constantly want to go beyond what they are. Actually, some of you know this, the Heart Sutra alludes to this, I think, in the end, when we recite gatte, gatte, paragatte, parasam gatte, bodhisvaha, or in English, gone, gone, gone beyond, gone utterly beyond enlightenment. Wow. So it seems to it seems to me that there's this inherent characteristic to life that it actually wants to go beyond itself. I find it astounding these days to sometimes think of the story of evolution. At Zen Center I coffee with a friend the other day, a German friend, who is a biologist and um, Zen priest. And he told me that in 
the biologist's understanding, the evolution must have happened in leaps. And I want to bring it up again. Uh, Dogen says, the Buddha way basically is leaping. I see a connection there. So, according to modern biology, what must have happened is that, for example, beings who crawled upon the earth for many generations suddenly burst into flight. Or, pre-humans, at one point in evolution, uh, stood up and freed their front legs and eventually invented computers <laughs> started to uh, play free jazz. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So this is actually what I mean by the energy of spring. And the Buddha way, maybe you sense where I'm trying to get at, the Buddha way itself <coughs> seems to be such, a, such an evolutionary unfolding or a leap. Please listen to it again. The Buddha way basically fundamentally, is leaping beyond the many and the one. So the way I see this as humans, uh, we carry in us sadness, fear, maybe a sense of being unfulfilled. So the whole array of difficult in emotions that the Buddha characterized as dukkha in the first noble truth. But I think we also want to leap. We want to go beyond. We want to go utterly beyond. We want to leap as humans into a state of uh, wholeness, completion, into a state of um, fearlessness, enlightenment. Wow, enlightenment uh, right now. <coughs> so, um, Practice, Buddhist practice, that I would say, besides everything else, that brings us together here today. Buddhist practice is an anxious passage to a place of release from whatever has confined us. It's an anxious passage to a place of release from whatever has confined us. The egg wants to crack, no matter how. <clears throat> and that which releases us from whatever has confined us, be it fear or loneliness or sexual hunger or states of greed, hate, and delusion, as we say, that which releases us is intimacy. In our usual take on things, the way we usually see things, intimacy is uh, synonymous with familiarity, uh, closeness, um, but also, I would say, understanding. 
So as social beings, uh, we have this deep wish. We want to live in familiarity with others. We want to feel the closeness of intimate bonds. And simply, we want to be understood. And these needs are very human. And I think we are actually very lucky if we can cultivate them. And we have to and should cultivate them. However, in a universe that is basically mm, impermanent and unpredictable, in a universe where, metaphorically speaking, some of us fall out of the nest prematurely, and some of us mature into beings who take off in flight. Some of us might have had the experience that our intimate relationships are built on quicksand. At least I, I have this experience in my life. And then what? Then what? For example, Years ago, a really good friend of mine said to me, I know my husband. And the way she said it was beautiful for me to see. It was full of conviction. And I saw the glowing love on her face. And then, a few weeks later, she found out that her husband, from the start, had not only betrayed her sexually, but also economically. <coughs> so, of course, she was devastated, and their intimate union ended in divorce. <coughs> and then a question arises. What went wrong? Did anything go wrong? And conventionally, I would say, yes, something went wrong. However, the universe, as it unfolds, <clears throat> as my friend's life, is neither right nor wrong. As I see it, uh, this um, anxious passage she was suddenly immersed in offered her a chance. It offered her a chance to become intimate with herself, but also it offered her a chance to become intimate with how things really are. And he did that in a dark, and from a human viewpoint, I think we could say almost sinister way. However, this is how often things are for us. <coughs> the way I see this, or the way I have come to see this <coughs> is that at times life offers us what I, I don't know where this came from, but I coined the term for myself, uh, dark mirrors. Life at times offers us dark mirrors. These mirrors often come to us as uh, scary, disappointing, and disheartening experiences. <coughs> However, they are big chances. They are turning points. <coughs> so if we have uh, the courage, um, but also the kindness and the patience 
to look into the darkness of these mirrors, um, they will reveal something important and deep to us. Uh, what I want to bring up is uh, a story from the Zen tradition about how people have been working with the dark mirrors of experience. So this particular story is, let's say, an exchange, a meeting like this between two guys, uh, Dharma friends in China, approximately in the 8th century. It's brief. It goes like this. And two guys, two friends, uh, one is called uh, Derzan, the other Fayan. So Derzan asks Fayan, where are you going? And Fayan says, I'm going around, I'm going around on pilgrimage. And the other guy says, Derzan says, so what's the purpose of pilgrimage? Bayan says, I don't know. I don't know. And to this, his friend says, Derzan says, not knowing is most intimate. Not knowing is most intimate. So the way I see this, being asked what he was doing in his life, what is the fundamental point, what's most important to you, Payan says, I'm going around on pilgrimage. And maybe it's the uh, non-native English speaker here, but I'm <clears throat> struck by the word around. I'm going around. So in my reading, uh, this guy, uh, Fai Yang, he already understood that most of us humans are going around. We sometimes have uh, the experience of being uh, caught in cycles, in repetitive cycles of painful experience. Uh, for example, in the last seven years, in the last seven years, uh, three times, or conventionally speaking, three men I wished to be intimate with uh, broke my heart. So I think in English we say three is a charm, right? <laughs> <laughs> but also there's some kind of idea that after seven years, things completely transform. So what I'm trying to say is it was actually only after the third time, and all three times, it was extremely painful for me. It was only after the third time that I felt finally willing and ready to look into the dark mirror that was actually the gift that I was given by these men. So, Thayan is in touch with that and he expresses his intention, his willingness to go beyond and to make a leap. His intention is to transform, we could say, Buddhist lingo, the rounds of samsara, turning round and round in the wheel of suffering. <clears throat> and to transform samsara, to transform the painful experience of our life into a pilgrimage 
I'm going around on pilgrimage. So, what is a pilgrimage? I would suggest to you, pilgrimage is nothing other but a path of compassion, joy, real joy, and loving kindness for ourselves and all beings. <clears throat> and how can we leap and go beyond? How can we leap into such a life of compassion, kindness for all beings? Um, I think the practice is to become intimate with ourselves and others, to become intimate with what's happening right now. And that's actually the leap. So, as I pointed out before, usually we think intimacy is knowing. <clears throat> we want to know others and we want to be known by others. So, Dersan's answer, again, not knowing is most intimate, might be surprising. So, in, in this aspect, I think this is a Zen lecture, because uh, Zen uh, turns our usual strategy to become intimate upside down and says not knowing is most intimate. There is a deep reason for that and I confess I'm not sure that I can express that but I want to try it. So please give me a few more minutes. Uh, another like towering figure of Zen in medieval China teacher Nan Chuan. He's the one, for some of you who know that, who threatened to cut the cat in two. About this exchange, in a commentary about this little story, he says, the way is not in knowing or not knowing. Knowing is false, false consciousness. Knowing is false consciousness. Not knowing is indifference. So, does this other Zen teacher, Nan Shuan, does he simply contradict Dersan? I don't think so. Dersan's not knowing is not what we usually mean by this. Not knowing as we usually understand it, is indifference. It's an attitude of, um, I don't care. Or it's an attitude of, um, I don't want to get involved in this. So the not knowing that I'm trying to speak of here this morning is actually something that arises once we have worked through our knowing. And then we leap. And then the egg breaks. And then we shed the skin. But in working through our knowing, I would suggest to you, we have to understand or to intuit why Nanshuan says uh, knowing is false consciousness. And I know this is a tricky topic. So, instead of maybe answering theoretically or, I don't know, philosophically, again, I want to give you an example from my own life, how I got a taste of how knowing is false consciousness. It came to me uh, viscerally about 12 years ago. I um, lived together 
was um, my intimate other actually around the corner from here on 22nd Street and Treat. And one morning, sitting across from him at the breakfast table, I wanted to bring something up that had hurt me, and I did. And I don't even remember if it was something that, let's say, he had expressed or done to me that hurt me, or if I just wanted to talk about something that hurt me. And I did. And he listened, and he responded. But then I started to notice how I got slightly irritated. And the more he said things, the more I got irritated. So that at a certain point, I said to him, would you please reflect back to me what I just said? And he did. And to my utter surprise, what I heard him say was, in my mind, the opposite of what I had intended to say. And actually, I don't remember anything that was being said, but I remember very d deeply an uncanny feeling. It was as if the rug was pulled out under my life. That's how deep this went. It was as if there were these uh, maybe tiny impish creatures between me and, let's say, you, Bob, and they were catching the word I said, turning the meaning around and putting it into the other person's ear. So, at that time, of course, I tried to convince him that he had misunderstood me. I felt not seen. I felt not known. I felt we weren't intimate with each other. It was actually quite painful. Now, looking back, I think I missed a wonderful chance to become intimate. This was one of the dark mirrors I want to talk about this morning. I missed a chance to become intimate with the fact that we are all vastly different from one another. That no one of us sees the world in the same way. But most of all, and this is now an important point to me, it was a chance to open up to a truth of relationship which is that if we are, we are in relationship with another person, we are first and foremost in relationship with ourselves. And I think that's an important point in the study and opening up to intimacy. And I want to say just a few things about that. <coughs> Um, I brought up the Heart Sutra. So the Heart Sutra, at least in its uh, short form that many of us recite, it uh, contains a condensed teaching about how we create our world. Information comes in uh, through the eye, ear, nose, through the sense of taste, tongue, through the entire body, and also through thinking. Then we grasp this information and make it into an objectively and separately existing world. 
that's how we know. That's how it works. That's how I can say, I'm here, and you are there. However, this is exactly what Nanshuan describes as a false consciousness. This is false consciousness. It's a basic Buddhist teaching. I think it's radical, and I also think that it's very difficult to really open up to this. It is false because it takes the content of consciousness for an objectively, separately existing world. It takes the content of our consciousness and claims this is not consciousness. This is an objectively world existing over there. <coughs> we cannot not be false. This is how the human mind works. And we have to openly confess that. That's starting to become intimate with it. So, uh, in listening to me, please pause for a moment and reflect upon how you actually know things. Objects, people, friends, loved ones. And then I would say, all we can realistically say is that we know them as our perceptions of them. That is all we have, and that is all we ever will have. Thich Nhat Hanh, in a book on the teachings of mind, said, <clears throat> most people are married to a concept of their spouse. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to express. So in this fundamental way, we are always, and very simply, in relationship with ourselves when we think that we are in relationship with others. We are in relationship with our thoughts, our emotions, our sexual excitements, our sadness. This is how it is. But of course, there is the other person. There is another person. We do not live in a solipsistic world. And I would say there is a very simple practice to enter the world of the other. It is to ask her or him questions. Who are you? Very simple. <coughs> Please, tell me about yourself. Oh, so uh, you are this person who feels engulfed when I tell you that I love you. How interesting. May I tell you, I'm the person who feels abandoned when I don't hear from you after three days. Isn't that amazing? <coughs> so, in this way, we can slowly and hopefully, carefully and kindly enter the entanglement <coughs> of intimate relationships. But still, it is an entanglement. And how can we disentangle it? If we study, and by that I simply mean if we deepen our awareness of what we think we know 
we will slowly enter the realm of not knowing without abandoning the realm of knowing. We will simply see that whatever we know does not reach or describe the other person. He, she, you are utterly beyond description. So Dirzan's not knowing is most intimate. Not knowing is most intimate. Comes to us, as I said before, when we have worked ourselves through our knowing. And that simply means that we have to mm, wholeheartedly acknowledge and express what we think we know without holding on to it, then we will leap and then the egg of our separate um, existence will crack. To end, Everything we know about ourselves and others is only a shadow. It's a dream about who we and who we are and who the other person is. So the practice of Zen, but I would say the practice of meditation and the practice of life itself is to let go of all grasping. Life wants to let go of all grasping and leap beyond. A lizard, which is grasped, will never fly. A human being grasped cannot sing. Leaping beyond, beyond, is a word for the intimacy which is already given before all knowing. Beyond is a word for right now. This intimacy is uncreated and therefore it doesn't cease. Intimacy uh, doesn't come and it doesn't go. There is nothing actually we can do to make it happen. However, there is a lot we do to not be aware of it. I want to say it again. Practice, as I see it these days, in this intense, for me at least, intense time of spring, is an anxious passage to a place of release from whatever has confined us. This release is always available. No matter how often we have the experience of turning round and round and round in old patterns, We always are on the cusp of spring. And spring is a leaping. So we leap beyond the many things we know, but we also leap beyond the oneness of not knowing. And this basically is the Buddha way. And the Buddha way is intimacy. So please leave. And thank you very much.
so <coughs> excuse me, I think that was a little longer. <laughs> it's okay if you if you can um, stay with us during our social hour. There might be some questions then. Please. Yes. I mean, excuse me, I don't want to change forms, but I'm also happy to sit here and have social hour in here. I'm sorry. I'm also happy to sit here with tea and have social hour in here. Is that an option, or should we all? Well, we do the social hour the, in the, the next room. Okay. So, <coughs> thank you very much, and let's meet. Are there announcements? Gary? Uh, on behalf of the uh, Program Committee at GEO, thank you, Bernard, for coming today and speaking to us. Next week, our speaker will be Pamela Weiss. Good. Good old friend. <coughs> okay. Yes, uh, good morning. My name is Kei Matsuda, and I'm the host this morning. And, and welcome to all of you. Uh, we have a social hour, and we have some refreshment. And feel free to have tea. But if you do use a uh, tea cup, please wash <coughs> them and put them back, put them back on the rack. Uh, we also have a sign-up sheet for new guests. Uh, if you'd like to stay in touch with this group and receive our uh, newsletter, please ask. Uh, Leave your name uh, and address, both street address and the email address, uh, on the sign-up sheet, uh, which is on credenza over there. And there's usually a group of people who uh, go out and have lunch together, and the group typically meet uh, around the front door of the building, either inside or outside, uh, around uh, 12.30. And finally, uh, I will be coming around with a donut ball, and suggested donation amount is 5 to $8, but we'll be happy to say uh, any amount, particularly the amount more than that. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for supporting GBF. Yeah. Um, there's, out by the Don Bowl, there's um, uh, new versions of our GBF directory, if you would like to take a copy. Um, also, I want to recommend um, Tom Morrissey and I are singing in the bass section of the, the San Francisco Choral Society, and we're singing uh, this Friday and Saturday. Um, uh, Schubert's Mass in E-flat, and it's all about what Barrett was talking about in terms of sort of cosmic intimacy. It's just very personal and gorgeous. Do you have anything else? It's, it's just breathtaking, and, and we're really good at it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to plug in a commercial for service for uh, GDF. I'm sort of a dinosaur in this group, and uh, I've done many uh, different kinds of service. And occasionally people get burnt out because they're doing service for so much. So um, I just wanted to ask maybe the, um, the steering committee. Well, um, there a lot of people have been doing the same things for a long time, and whether or not that discourages people from stepping forward or not, I don't, I don't really know. Um, well, what are the positions you think that need people to come into? Well, we need people to transcribe talks. Um, we, I, you know, it'd be great if we just had a, a list of people who are willing to do odd jobs, rather than have to go around making, you know, begging, employing people to do stuff. Um, no one responded to repeated requests to take on the mailing list, which was discouraging. Um, uh, but uh, Marvin Snow and um, Tom Hurley have, have taken that on. Um, it just, you know, there's, there's a lot of small stuff that has to get. Um, taken care of, and to have a maybe a little team of on-call people would be helpful. 
Am I responding to the question? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't know what small tasks incur. It's <coughs> hard to do. Well, I'd like the recording. Um, George is not going to be able to be here very often. It would be wonderful <laughs> if someone would um, take responsibility to be in touch with George and and um, take responsibility for the recordings when he's not here. It's just stuff like that. I'm sort of the default backup guy, and I don't know why that's so, but it, it, that's just our default. Hmm. Um, so it's just little stuff like that. You know. Copying the roster, you know, just uh, getting the mailing list of people. It's, it's uh, they're just small things that um, the same old tired people end up doing because it's easier to do it yourself sometimes than to root around for a volunteer. So. Ray, do you have any? Uh, I would just say uh, if anyone is interested or feels moved to be a facilitator, like like what David is mm -hmm. doing today, uh, please speak to me. We're always looking for someone to fill in off and on for facilitation. So if you feel confident or interested in doing that, please talk, talk to me. Any other announcements? Um, I would just add before we do our closing that um, <clears throat> We've announced we're going to do our social hour out in the other room, and Bernd will be available um, for questions. And you're all available to each other to meet members your Sangha and our new members. Hopefully, we'll stay we'll stay around. If anyone, um, I do this every once in a while. If anyone wants <coughs> to talk about practice, about their meditation practice, or get instructions, or give instructions, or share. Um, what's going on with the practice. Um, I will stay in this room during the social hour for that, for anybody that might want to talk about practice or have questions or whatever. So I'm going to stay in here um, during the social hour if you're interested in that. So let's all gather in a circle for <coughs> conclusion. <laughs> the merit of our practice on this beautiful damp spring morning to all beings and to the intimacy between all beings near and far here and there may all beings experience this intimacy may all beings be happy may all beings be free Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.